Chris Clark was supposed to be the Tina Marie of Motown, but Barry Gordy ain't do it right. We back in front of the camera today, y'all. I gotta sell some stuff. Go on over there to uptopbeauty.com and check out my super fly shades. I got them in beige and black. Now, let's get into this Mary Wells book. In any case, Gordy presented Harris with a brand new contract for Wells to sign. Its terms are unknown. Harris said he would tell Wells that Motown was the best place for her and that she ought to sign the new contract and stay with the company. Gordy's offer and her attorney's endorsement of it were far from what Wells was expecting. She fired Harris immediately and hired a Detroit lawyer, Herbert Eags. Eags came out of his corner fighting. His first move was to present Gordy on July 12th with notification from Wells, this time in writing that she was disaffirming her Motown contract. Gordy was quoted as being surprised and hurt when he learned that Wells was apparently receptive to offers from other record companies. We loved her, he told author David Ritz. Everyone at the company had a great relationship with Mary. Most seriously, Wells gave up all future royalties on the records she already had made for Motown in return for a payment of $30,000 from the company. $30,000? Man, I don't care what you say. Some of y'all might be like, $30,000 is uh, basically probably like a million then. All right, that ain't enough. Like when Barry Gordy sold Motown in the 80s for, I think it was like six million. It's like six million. And you could find six million in, in your couch cushions, you know. And I know you're like, nay, you being a little extra. Real talk, some of you guys have spent millions and millions and millions of dollars and don't even realize it. I'm sure. You all spent millions just on one child alone. Wells says she regretted this part of the settlement for the rest of her life. The deal made sense at the time because Motown executives stopped promoting a song as soon as they thought it had completely exhausted its sales potential and royalties accordingly dropped off. No one could foresee that an enormous wave of nostalgia for songs by Wells and other Motown stars would develop in future years. Mm -mm -mm. I think uh, Brandon, one of my members, my sweetie pie, told me that he learned about the song My Guy from watching uh, Sister Act. I don't know which one he said, one or two, something like that. But to think that that song was in the movie and she didn't get paid a dime for it. Oh, my goodness. This meant that within Wells' lifetime, Advertising agencies, big corporations, Muzak and Hollywood could and would endlessly and legally recycle many of her Motown tunes without paying Wells a dime for the privilege. Mm -mm -mm. As time passed, Motown continued to punish Murray for her abandonment of the company that had nurtured her professionally. That ain't nothing new. Murray Gordy is the most vindictive mother. Africa in the world. I think because he takes betrayal so personally and in his sick, twisted way of believing that we are all family and we stick together like a family, you know, like the mafia, because you know, Bird Gordy, he sub think he's a gangster. Nobody gets away with hurting his feelings. It ain't about hurting the company. It's about hurting his feelings. You know, bury bed bug bites. The only way that a bed bug can survive is unless he got a human being to suck off of. At the time of the contract dispute, Motown had been planning an international and upscale offensive with Mary becoming the first Motown act to tour the United Kingdom as well as the first Motown performer to appear at New York City's chic 
Copacabana nightclub. Damn. I forgot who said it in this book, but they said that if Murray Wells would have stayed, there wouldn't have been no Diana Ross. Now, again, I don't know about that. To think that the Supremes was the catalyst for other Motown acts to perform at the Copacabana. The only reason why the door was open for the Supremes was because Murray Wells had left. Wow. Because Mary's lawsuit seeking release from her Motown contract was still in court when the UK tour arrangements were completed. She started the tour October 9th and completed it 33 days later. Even though the decision releasing her from her contract had been handed down October 5th. But the UK tour was her final act, even semi-related to her Motown employment. Motown gave the Copa gig to the Supremes. Wow. Motown did not issue Mary's version of When I'm Gone, which she had recorded just before telling Gordy she was through, until 1966. Although the company did have Brenda Holloway re-record a version that was released in 1965, When I'm Gone is a haunting sensual tune in any context and obviously had top 40 potential. Holloway's version reached number 25 on the Billboard chart. It's easy to see, though, why Motown waited so long to issue Mary's version, which went nowhere when the company finally released it. Gordy also insisted all Motown contracts signed by artists when they were under 21 be renegotiated and re-signed so that no one else could ever do to him what Mary had done. This tactic resulted in several artists staying at Motown longer than they wanted to at least in retrospect. Martha Reeves, for instance, found herself committed to a new Motown contract that required her to do two years on top of the eight she had already signed up for in 1962. Despite all of Gordy's moves, however, Motown still had a huge problem. As Mary put it, Motown had to find somebody to take my place as a solo artist. Although the Supremes took over as the company's big hit makers, the spot of top female Motown soloist remained unfulfilled for years. Motown eventually saved itself through the creativity of its songwriters and producers and the willingness of its vocalists to work extremely hard for what was often less than they could have earned elsewhere. First, Motown vocalist Chris Clark. We know So Chris we Clark. know Chris Clark because she helped Barry Gordy write Lady Sings the Blues. Now before she was that, she was Donna Ross's sister wife. Barry Gordy would be in the middle suite. To the left would be Chris Clark awaiting the arms of Barry Gordy. And to the right would be Diana Ross awaiting the arms of Barry Gordy. But you know Chris Clark had to wait for Diana Ross to be through with him. I got to fuck the star first. Chris Clark was supposed to be the Tina Marie of Motown, but Barry Gordy ain't do it right. First Motown vocalist, Chris Clark, a six foot white, blue eyed, platinum blonde whose admirers complimented her by calling her the white negress. Just like the Tina Marie. Attempted to replace Wells in the affections of her fans. But although Murray called Clark the best singer at Motown after I left, Clark had nothing on Wells in the hits department. Her one hit, Love's Gone Bad, which made it to number 41 on the Billboard R&B in 1966, rose only to number 105 on the Billboard pop chart. Clark eventually rounded off her Motown career by co-writing the screenplay for Motown's first movie, Lady Sings the Blues, which stars Diana Ross. The company was more successful with Kim Weston. Her most popular single, Take Me In Your Arms, Rock Me A Little While, released in 1965, rose to number four on the Billboard R&B chart and to number 50 on the Billboard pop chart. And her duet with Marvin Gaye, It Takes Two, Baby, It Takes Two, Baby, 
Me and You, released in 1966, rose to number four on the R&B chart and number 14 on the pop chart. She then declined rapidly on both the R&B and pop charts. Motown did slightly better when it attempted to slip Brenda Holloway into Mary's star slot. You know Brenda Holloway. Uh, Brenda Holloway was the lady that Barry Gordy used to goop dickity clarkity with his caravan of stars. Hello, yes, this is Barry Gordy. Hey, Barry, this is Dick. I want Brenda Holloway. Oh, you do, do you? You can have her. Oh, thanks, man. All right. Uh, wait a minute, Dickie. Uh, you can have Brenda, but you gotta take the Supremes with ya. I don't want the Supremes. Well, you can't have Brenda without the Supremes. See you when I see you. Motown did slightly better when it attempted to slip Brenda Holloway into Mary's star slot. Holloway had practically cast herself as a second Mary Wells by singing along to My Guy at a DJ convention in a successful attempt to capture Gordy's interest. Not only did Motown hire her, the Beatles chose her as one of the opening acts for their 1965 American tour, a spot Mary had filled on their 1964 UK tour. Holloway had shown herself to be serious competition for Wells at Motown. Even better, Mary left the company when Holloway's tune, Every Little Bit Hurts, rose to number 13 on the Billboard R&B chart and number 13 on the Billboard Pop chart in 1964. She rose higher on the R&B chart to number 12 and hit number 25 on the pop chart when she re-recorded Mary's tune, When I'm Gone, in 1965, but declined thereafter. Eventually, Diana Ross solved Gordy's casting problem in a big way. After years of captivating the public as lead vocalist for the Supremes, she separated from the group in 1970 and replaced Mary as the company's superstar female soloist, a position she kept until she left Motown in 1981. If I remember correctly, Timmy, if I remember correctly, uh, I think it was RCA that offered her $20 million. And Barry Gordy was like, you know I ain't got that kind of goddamn money. According to Sugar Ray, Barry Gordy offered her a piece of the company, um, but he wouldn't marry her. Because according to rumors, Donna Ross said, okay, I'll stay if you marry me. And Barry was like, uh-uh, I don't want to do that. I don't want to marry you, girl. That's too much pressure. I don't want to marry my bottom bitch. I did that before with Sugar Ray. Mary certainly noticed Motown's attempts to create a successor after she left, and she was generous in her evaluation of other soloist talents. When Chris Clark recorded the Wells tune, Whisper, You Love Me Boy, in 1968, Murray called it a slap in the face because it was so much better than mine. Motown did not issue Murray's version of Whisper, You Love Me Boy until after Murray's death. Although the Supremes had saved Motown from a devastating post Mary decline, relations between Mary and her first employer remained tense for many years. In 1983, Motown produced a television special titled Motown 25 yesterday today and forever and invited Murray to appear on it the part that we getting ready to get into next i didn't realize how insulting it was the way that they treated murray wells at motown 25 so let's continue although some would say it was amazing that wells was invited at all she was, of course, the entertainer who had given the Motown label its first number one hit and the one who had held the company together economically while the Supremes were struggling to gain traction. Mary performed gamely for the broadcast, singing one verse of My Guy while supporting a bulky blonde wig and wearing a blue gown that was attractive but appeared to be made of a substance resembling bubble wrap. Ain't nobody asked you for your goddamn uh, fashion commentary, Joan Rivers. It more or less disguised the fact that she was pregnant with twins. What? Girl, hold on. Many of Mary's friends 
and supporters considered it a gross insult that she was given only 30 seconds of stage time in a segment of the show that was meant to honor individual DJs and TV personalities as much as individual voters. Y'all, I connected my Motown 25 review to uh, the end of each video along with the playlist for Mary Wells. Oh man, that, 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 that day has to be one of the greatest days of my life in regards to television. But you know, they had the two WKRP DJs. I think his name is Howard, Hess, Howard Hessman. And the other dude's name was Tim Reed. What? Reading this book right now, that lady deserved way more than just 30 seconds of my guy. I didn't realize how powerful she was at Motown. Okay. They should have honored her and treated her with the same royalty that they treated Diana Ross. Because after all, Murray Wells was first. If there was no Murray Wells, there would be no Diana Ross. If Murray Wells wouldn't have popped that thing off, Diana Ross wouldn't even had had the opportunity to become a big star. But then again, if it wasn't for Sugar Ray, there would be no Motown child, and they ain't even put her name in the credits. Sugar Ray being Raynoma Gordy Singleton. Burry's Gordy's, what is that, second wife? If so, the insult was followed by injury when Mary later miscarried the twins. She didn't blame it on the performance. However, noting that both her mother and grandmother had miscarried sets of twins. In any case, Michael Jackson outshone Mary and every other artist on the show by introducing his moonwalk during his appearance and the after the show argument over Mary's treatment was overshadowed by gossip about the behavior of insecure superstar Diana Ross during the taping of the show. You say that you love me.